All right. Well, so um, welcome uh, again to uh, Internal Medicine Grand Rounds for this week. Um, I am excited to continue sort of our updates series and to have um, four outstanding speakers from rheumatology join us today. So I'm going to um, very, very briefly introduce uh, everyone and, uh, and the main topic that they're going to address, and then I will sort of let them take it from there and um, handle the transitions in between so that I'm not talking anymore. So we'll start out with Dr. Sam Lim who is a, um, a professor of medicine, and these are obviously all faculty members in rheumatology. So he's a professor of medicine as well as of epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health. He is, I think, the old stalwart of the four of you, having been at Emory since um, 2002. Um, he is also the chief of rheumatology at Grady, where he founded and directs the Grady Lupus Clinic and will be talking to us about lupus today. Following him will be Dr. Freya Yelly. Um, she uh, is an assistant professor of uh, rheumatology here at Emory um, and completed her fellowship training um, at Emory in 2013, after which um, she joined faculty. Her particular interest is in sarcoidosis, and she established a sarcoidosis program within the Division of Rheumatology, and that will be the topic of her presentation today. Following her will be Dr. Pratik Gandiga. He is also an assistant professor um, at Emory. He completed his um, fellowship in rheumatology at the University of Pennsylvania and also did some NIH clinical research uh, training um, through their program. Um, actually, Pratik, I realized I don't know when you joined us here at Emory. Um, it's been a few years now, actually. I feel like I'm an old hand. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, anyway, he um, has... Um, uh, uh, founded the uh, myositis clinic um, here um, at uh, Emory, the uh, myositis rheumatology specialized clinic. And so he will be talking about myositis today. And then rounding out this group of four, last but not least, is Dr. Rezu Kushrashahi, who um, completed her uh, fellowship at Mass General Hospital and uh, also joined us in 2013. She is a well-established expert in IgG4 related disease um, and has talked to this group before uh, about that topic, but today we'll be talking about COVID and autoimmunity. So welcome um, to the four of you, to everyone else, as always, um, please feel free to put your questions in chat and we will take questions for all four of our speakers at the end rather than um, uh, fielding them in between presentations. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lim, um, to kick us off. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. So it's a, a pleasure to speak to you all today about uh, lupus. There's uh, a lot to be said for sure. Um, as you all know, it's a chronic autoimmune disease. It's in many ways the prototypic autoimmune disease in terms of multi-system involvement. It's characterized by um, an array of autoantibodies and the production of immune complexes that then trigger inflammation and lead to uh, tissue damage if left untreated over time. It interestingly has a very predominant impact on, on females, especially uh, in the reproductive age, um, and a predominance in minority groups in the U.S., especially those of African ancestry, Asians, and Hispanics. And this is all uh, related in part to genetics. That there's certainly a role there for sure, but it clearly, like most systemic autoimmune diseases, is in, interacting with a variety of environmental factors, which we're trying to uh, delineate. So with, with a lot going on in lupus, and, and there's so much that I could talk about, I thought I would focus mostly on uh, treatments, which really hasn't been uh, too much in the news for the uh, past several decades, actually. I mean, this is just a short list of uh, general immunosuppressive approaches that we use. Um, and you can see here uh, what strikes you is that there's relative paucity of directed immunologic therapies and biologics. Uh, lupus has not uh, benefited from the revolution that's occurred in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and other conditions in terms of the technologies that we have available. And some of it is in large part, uh, in large part due to that um, the the challenges of clinical trial design. You know how how do you follow people with such heterogeneity clinically, uh, and and also immunologically that we're trying to uh, um, 
elucidate better. But in any case, the field has advanced to the point where we have some good outcomes measures that we're able to detect signals and, and move forward from there. And it may surprise some of you to know that really up until 2011, there were essentially only a few drugs formally approved by the FDA for lupus. Uh, and those include aspirin, um, and you can see the antimalarials of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and, and quinacrine. And then uh, metacortin is basically a, a glucocorticoid. So uh, antimalarials, aspirin, and, um, and glucocorticoids were the official FDA-approved drugs up until 2011. Uh, and everything else we use off-label, which is fine, but it, it just tells you uh, the relative lack of impact uh, new treatments have had in this space. And that changed in 2011 when the um, biologic delimumab or Benlista was approved for non-renal lupus. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about that in a minute. Uh, what's happened recently though, uh, have been treatments with, with respect to lupus nephritis specifically. And, that, and, and that's really needed um, in general for lupus, but uh, specifically for those with renal involvement. And you can see here, this is data from our epidemiology study that the CDC has funded for many years, right in our backyard. And these are incident patients, new onset disease from the time of their diagnosis, the cumulative percentage who go on to kidney failure. And you can see the burden is extremely high that at eight years or so, you have about 10% of incident patients on a population level go into kidney failure. And keep in mind that these are individuals that are predominantly female, younger, and, and from communities of color. And you can, imagine, you can appreciate the impact that that can have. So I mentioned uh, belimumab or Benlista. Uh, it's the most recently approved drug for, for lupus, uh, originally for non-renal involvement. And it just got indication in the past year as a, an add-on therapy um, for the standard of care for uh, proliferative lupus nephritis, which is uh, IV cyclophosphamide um, or oral mycophenolimophetil. But belimumab is a, it, it impacts um, the B lymphocyte stimulator or bliss cytokine, which is expressed and it's rapidly cleaved by myeloid cells and other immune cells. Uh, bliss tends it binds to uh, receptors on the surfaces of normal and autoreactive B cells, signaling them to survive, mature, and differentiate into antibody and autoantibody producing cells. And so what belimumab does is it binds to these soluble bliss um, cytok cytokines, these proteins, to prevent it basically from signaling through receptors on both normal as well as more specifically the autoreactive B cells that are pathologic in lupus. So this was approved for uh, non-renal lupus. And um, as I mentioned, after this New England Journal study, it was approved for uh, renal involvement. And what I'll point out here is uh, just some slides uh, from the original paper. And the PERR or PER is basically a, a unique composite endpoint that the company put together of, of renal endpoints uh, as one of the primary outcomes. And then you can see here, CRR, uh, complete renal response <clears throat> that's defined in a certain way. But you know, um, one thing I'll point out is that over time in, in all of the boxes, you can see the improvement on quote unquote standard of care, uh, which is okay. And then there's the incremental um, effect size improvement of the Limimab over time. And that's all good. Um, but what I'll also point out is that uh, the lack of response in the majority of, of patients over time. And so it's great that there's more uh, um, involvement of new therapeutics in this space, but we really need to get a better handle overall on the pathophysiology of the disease, but also um, specifically lupus nephritis. And along these lines, um, talking to a general audience as well, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the most important things, regardless of the drug, in terms of making an impact on the overall outcomes of these patients, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a general principle, really, in, 
in a lot of conditions is that of earlier identification and treatment. So a simple UA, which is really cheap, uh, it needs to be repeated at least a couple times a year and you can catch early involvement and, and screening. So keep, please keep that in mind. The other drug that was approved in this space is voclosporin or leukinase, which is a novel calcineurin inhibitor. It's an analog of cyclosporin A, which has been used uh, uh, in lupus nephritis. Um, but frankly, it's not used really much by uh, rheumatologists. We, uh, we have, um, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. Uh, we just don't like following the serum concentration and uh, we don't use it in other areas like transplant that the nephrologists do. So it's really gone out of favor for us in particular in rheumatology. Um, this new formulation does not have that issue. It's orally dosed twice daily. There's no serum concentration monitoring required, which is really the big advance. It, it's got increased potency, uh, less metabolite exposure, um, and, and it had some really good preliminary studies. So it was granted fast track approval um, by the FDA. Uh, so fast that the, the study hasn't been published yet to my knowledge, but you can see the uh, some presentation of the data from their phase three study showing the incremental improvement on top of standard of care of mycophenolate mofetil um, over um, 24 and 52 weeks. Now, what will be important really over time is what, what happens well beyond a year for these patients. And so um, that's going to be up for further investigation as time goes on for both of these drugs. But as I mentioned earlier, we really need a lot more um, activity in this space in general. And thankfully, both in renal and non-renal lupus, there, there's a lot of activity in the biologic and small molecule space. And hopefully over time, that will give us a better understanding of outcomes and the immunopathology of these conditions. So I'll end with uh, talking briefly about hydroxychloroquine. And I'll underscore how rheumatologists, especially of my generation, love hydroxychloroquine. We love it. Um, we have an emotional tie to it. It's, it's an old drug. It's, a, it's an oldie but goodie. It's cheap. It's on the list of WHO um, critical drugs uh, in the world. And for all this data, and uh, given um, the issues that we have in lupus, uh, to have this type of data behind it is, uh, is really great. Um, you know, the utilization of hydroxychloroquine and other formulations like chloroquine in this country was increased in early 2020 as a result of some initial reports, as you know, of anti-coronavirus activity, which basically proved to be untrue in randomized controlled trials. But, you know, in that setting, um, we, we knew that hydroxychloroquine, especially when you couple it with azithromycin, can have an impact in terms of prolonging QT intervals and um, contributing to the cardiac arrhythmias that were reported. But also what, what's kind of new is that we didn't really realize how much that that was an issue for asymptomatic patients that don't have COVID. And uh, we never really picked that up in rheumatology anyway. And so there's this enhanced awareness of the prolonging effects of the QT interval of hydroxychloroquine. And how clinically relevant that is, is going to be up for debate. And so keep an eye out for it. And, and you know, it, one can say it's simply a matter of getting an EKG, but it has a lot of practical effects on patient acceptance. And not all rheumatologists have an EKG machine um, and who would read it and all of that. So keep that in mind. So with that, I'm done and I'm going to pass it to my partners. Let me get out of here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, um, this is uh, Freya Yeller. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of uh, sarcoidosis. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay. Yes. So sarcoidosis is a multi-system um, disease of unknown etiology, as you know. Uh, we don't know what antigen triggers, triggers it. Um, there is interest in, in uh, mycobacteria being as triggers. Um, there are also many environmental triggers that are uh, thought to uh, start the inflammatory reaction. Um, uh, there is gen genetic predisposition, but it's uh, thought that 
exposure to some type of antigen causes inflammatory activity resulting in non-casating granulomas. Any organ can be involved. I have put some pictures on the slide as you see. The lungs are the most commonly involved organs and you see on, on the left um, a chest X-ray of a patient with bilateral hyalurid lymphadenopathy. In the middle, you see um, cardiac MRI on the left of a patient with cardiac sarcoidosis showing late gadolinium enhancement. And um, right next to it, you see um, FDG PET scan of the same patient with increased uptake corresponding to the areas of gadolinium enhancement. And then here up, uh, you see um, a, a picture of a patient with lupus perneo, which is one of the classic rashes of uh, sarcoidosis uh, where you know, patients would have erythematous and violaceous papules and plaques. It's a very destructive type of skin disease, which is associated with cyanonasal sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, destructive arthritis, and overall um, a poor prognosis. And down here, you see um, a picture of a patient with um, anterior uveitis with cop you know, cop nodules, which are nodules that are found on the inner margins of the iris in patients with anterior um, uveitis. Sarcoidosis is more common um, in African Americans. Um, and it's more common in African Americans in, Scan in Scandinavian countries and less common in Asians. Um, it's slightly more common in women than in men. African Americans have a worse prognosis compared to Caucasians. Um, the class, one of the classic presentations of sarcoidosis, um, Lofgren syndrome, is more common in Caucasians and um, less common in Asians and African Americans. Um, sarcoidosis is an old disease. We have known about it for over 100 years, uh, but there is really few um, updates on the subject. And um, most of the treatments that we use are based on observational studies, not really based on randomized trials. Recently in 2020, the American Thoracic Society developed guidelines on the diagnosis and detection of sarcoidosis. The guideline basically has three components. One is on indication for lymph node sampling. The second one is for screening of extrapulmonary disease. And the last one is for diagnostic evaluation of suspected cardiac sarcoidosis. So they don't recommend lymph, lymph node biopsy for patients who have a classic presentation with Lofgren syndrome. So in Lofgren syndrome, um, patients present with bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, inflammatory arthritis that commonly involves the ankles, but it can involve the knees and other joints and erythema nodosum. Uh, so if a patient presents um, with a classic uh, Lofgren syndrome, no need to, to biopsy. Um, also patients who present with, with Hilford syndrome, uh, which presents with par parotid enlargement, uveitis, um, and fevers, and facial palsy. There's no need to biopsy because this is a very classic presentation of sarcoidosis. And then the picture that I showed you on the first slide, lupus perneo. If a patient has lupus perneo, which it's, it's, it's a very classic presentation of um, sarcoidosis. You don't really see it with other diseases and um, there is no need for biopsy. Um, in patients who have bilateral hyalur and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, endoscopic guided biopsy is the preferred method of biopsy, not mediastinoscopy. If a lymph node is not accessible by ultrasound guided biopsy, then you can consider mediastinoscopy. But the first line they recommend is endo endoscopic um, guided ultrasound uh, biopsy. And um, these are recommendations for screening of extrapulmonary sarcoidosis. Most of what's on the slide, we already know from other guidelines. Uh, most of the evidence uh, in this guideline was based on uh, you, you know, observational data and uh, not strong evidence. The only strong recommendation that's based on evidence is to check calcium to screen for hypercalcemia. Um, the other um, recommendations are conditional recommendations based on very little evidence. Um, so CBC to screen for bone marrow involvement, so alkaline phosphatase to screen for liver disease, um, creatinine for kidney involvement, and they recommend checking 25 hydroxy vitamin D level and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level if vitamin D um, assessment is needed. For example, if you're considering to treat a patient with vitamin D, you need to check both because if a patient has elevated 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level, you shouldn't give them vitamin D because they will be at risk of hypercalcemia. 
and then baseline eye exam in, uh, for, to screen for ocular involvement in all patients and EKG to screen for cardiac involvement in all patients, regardless of symptoms. And then the third part is diagnostic evaluation of suspected car uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. So as I discussed in the, on the previous slide, EKG for all patients, regardless of symptoms. Um, and they don't recommend echocardiogram or ambulatory EKG in asymptomatic patients. There's no agreement whether or not we should use echocardiogram to screen for cardiac um, involvement. Um, but in this guideline, they said not to perform it in patients who have no symptoms. And cardiac MRI is the first uh, imaging um, modality that's uh, recommended to screen for uh, suspected cardiac sarcoidosis in PET if ca uh, cardiac MR is unavailable. And tra transthoracic echocardiogram to screen for pulmonary hypertension, this is based on very little evidence. Um, and then right heart, heart characterization in patients who have echocardiographic evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So I just wanted to say a few words on cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, so there was a publication of um, data from the Danish registry uh, of 11,834 patients with sarcoidosis who, who at baseline have no heart failure or arrhythmia or any cardiac symptoms. These patients were matched by age, sex, and comorbidities with 47,000 individuals with no, cardiac, with no sarcoidosis. And the patients who have sarcoidosis had a higher risk of heart failure and adverse cardiac events and 10-year mortality. So after this study, there's an emphasis for screening patients with sarcoidosis for cardiac involvement. And also um, using advanced imaging like cardiac MRI and PET in patients who have symptoms. So when we see patients in the clinic, we always have to ask them about cardiac symptoms, shortness of breath, palpitations, and we have to have a low threshold to screen for cardiac involvement because these are patients who didn't have any symptoms, had increased cardiac events and mortality compared to uh, people who, do, who don't have sarcoidosis. So cardiac involvement is seen in two to 5% of patients with sarcoidosis clinically, but autopsy series show cardiac involvement in 25% of patients. MRI is the initial imaging modality and PET is increasingly used to diagnose and monitor sarcoidosis. Um, so PET scan can help us identify extra sites, extra cardiac sites of organ involvement, like to select tissue for biopsy. Um, it, getting a baseline card, card, uh, cardiac PET will help us monitor treatment response in the future. Um, it also gives us prognosis, um, prognostic um, Prognosis, it could also helps us um, estimate prognosis based on responders and non-responders to therapy. And also uh, it allows us to quantify the amount of inflammation uh, or the sort, sort of like the granuloma burden. Um, and recently there is a hybrid PET cardiac MR imaging that's being developed to assess cardiac function, cardiac structure, extent of scarring and active inflammation. Cardiac MR may show us late gadolinium enhancement, and sometimes it's very difficult to know if the patient has the gadolinium enhancement due to scarring or due to ongoing inflammation. There has been interest um, in, the, you know, in identifying a biomarker for diagnosis and prognosis of, of sarcoidosis. Many different biomarkers have been studied. I just put some uh, serum biomarkers. Uh, the most widely studied one is serum S. Um, uh, that has been studied since the 1970s. It's neither sensitive nor specific. It's elevated in two thirds of patients. How I use it, I check it, I always check it. Uh, and if it's elevated, it may help me as, uh, follow the patient's treatment response. But if it's normal, it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have, doesn't have sarcoidosis. And there are many other conditions, including infection, silicosis, berylliosis, which could, can give you elevated ACE and malignancy too. Um, there is increased interest in soluble IL-2 as a marker. Again, it's not sensitive or specific, uh, but um, it correlates with granuloma burden and some sarcoid experts use it to monitor disease activity. Um, recently, um, on the BA, on BAL fluid, increased ratio of CD4, CD8 is used to, the, to dis distinguish sarcoidosis from other types of ILD. And um, CD8, CD4 to CD8 ratio is actually recently included in the 
diagnostic criteria of ocular sarcoidosis. So the diagnostic criteria for ocular sarcoidosis has two parts. One is ocular science of sarcoidosis, and the second is investigating other sites of sarcoidosis. And one of, um, one of the things that they look for is a CD4 to CD8 ratio on, on BAL fluid. And there is increased interest now of, of um, on JAK and STAT signaling, which I will discuss on my uh, future, one of the future slides. So just to briefly go over the treatment of sarcoidosis, steroids constitute the first line of therapy. Um, we have used steroids for many, many years to treat sarcoidosis, but we also have to consider starting a steroid sparing agent early in the course. Not everybody has to be started on steroid sparing therapy. Some patients go into remission just with a few months of steroids. But if patients have multi-organ involvement or if the major organs like the brain and the heart are involved, you should, we should start steroid sparing therapy early in the course to avoid compl complications of long-term steroid therapy. The second, the second line agents are the oral medications and the most commonly one is methotrexate for both pulmonary and extrapulmonary sarcoidosis. Third line agents are TNF inhibitors, infliximab and adalimumab. There are, main, there are other TNF inhibitors, but they have not been shown to be effective for sarcoidosis. And in patients who have life or organ threatening disease, we can use rituximab and cyclophosphamide. Um, this is a slide that summarizes the pathophysiology and potential therapeutic targets of refractory sarcoidosis. Basically, sarcoidosis is, an, is caused by an immune response to an identified antigen. Um, that antigen will be taken by antigen present in cells, processed and presented to the T cell, and that interaction will lead to the release of multiple cyto cytokines, most common ones being um, TNF, alpha, interferon gamma, and several, diff several different types of interleukins, and also B cell activation uh, and release of BAF, which is B cell activating uh, factor, also called BLIS or B cell um, uh, uh, stimulator. Um, so, those cytokines will, uh, will lead to activation of JAK stat pathway, interferon gamma that's released by the T cells activates JAK stat pathway, Janus um, uh, kinase um, and stat pathway. And um, that would lead, uh, that's told to, to play in the clinical presentation of patients, especially cutaneous disease and pulmonary sarcoidosis. Um, there is an int interest in using rituximab for sarcoidosis. There are no randomized clinical trials. So these are emerging therapies. Um, I just want to say briefly some a few things about JAK inhibitors. Uh, JAK stands for gynus kinase, um, and STAT stands for signal trans transducer and activator of transcription. Tofacitinib is uh, the first JAK inhibitor that uh, has been approved in rheumatology. And it, there was a New England Journal of Medicine article in 2018 uh, where a patient with cutaneous sarcoidosis who did not respond to multiple different uh, immunosuppressive medications uh, was treated with tofacitinib and had significant improvement of, the, of, of their skin lesion. So they uh, took a skin, bi skin biopsy before starting tofacitinib and after, after uh, treatment response. And they saw that the JAK stat signature was decreased on the follow-up skin biopsy. After that, there were three other patients with recalcitrant cutaneous sarcoidosis who were treated with uh, tofacitinib and had excellent response. And there was another patient with multi-system sarcoidosis not responsive to multiple other agents which responded to tofacitinib. And another JAK inhibitor called baricitinib, which is more selective, has also been used in a patient with persistent fevers due to sarcoidosis that did not respond to multiple um, agents. And there is now an open um, label trial of facitinib in pulmonary and cutaneous sarcoidosis. Um, Apremilast is a, a phosphodiesterase for, for inhibitor. Um, there was a, a study of 15 patients who were treated with it, and 14 out of the 15 patients had excellent response. This it was used for cutaneous sarcoidosis, and now there is an open label study. Um, there have not been any case reports of this interleukin-1 monoclonal antibodies, but they are, you know, interleukin-1 is one of the cytokines released in sarcoidosis, and there are um, randomized trials, kanakinumab for pulmonary sarcoidosis and anakinra for uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. And this antibiotic, the antimicrobial regimen, a combination of levofloxacin, etamitol, azithromycin, and rifampicin was 
tried in cutaneous and pulmonary sarcoidosis. This is based on um, studies that showed that maybe mycobacteria uh, could be the causing for some, you know, could be the etiologic agents of um, sarcoidosis. Um, and there were two pilot studies. One was for cutaneous sarcoidosis and one was for pulmonary sarcoidosis. Um, in both studies, the patients had significant improvement. The patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis had, half of them had um, uh, improvement in their F FVC and uh, about 60% of patients with cutaneous sarcoidosis had improvement of their skin lesion. So um, this is what I have. And thank you for listening. I will pass it on to the next presenter. Very cool. So thank you guys so much for inviting me to join as well. I'm Pratik Indiga. I have a special interest in myositis. I'll try and keep myself to 10 minutes, which is kind of hard because myositis is really, really cool. But um, you'll forgive me if I go a little bit over. Um, I wanted to start by way of a story. So a couple of years ago, one of my friends uh, from high school actually gave me a call and his mom had been in the hospital for a couple of weeks difficulty standing up from a seated position, having difficulty brushing her teeth, ended up with this rash, which I've shared with her permission, and they didn't know what to end up doing. And for many of you guys, this is an across the room diagnosis for dermatomyositis, but when we ended up calling up the, uh, the doctors, most of them hadn't been thinking of it, only about a third of them had heard of that. So now fast forward to the last time that I was on service, and these days we're getting almost one to three consults almost every month for uh, myositis. So obviously there's increasing awareness that this disease exists. And that kind of parallels the recent trend that we've ended up seeing in advances in the characterization, diagnosis and treatments of this autoimmune muscle disease. So if we start with thinking about the characterization, this disease was really described back in the 1970s or so with Bohan and Peters classification of classic polymyositis and classic dermatomyositis. It really breaks down to three things. So number one, the stereotypical weakness of proximal muscle disease, kind of painless, progressive, objective evidence of autoimmune muscle inflammation, and in the case of dermatomyositis, some characteristic rashes that we end up seeing. And over the years, people have tried to expand on the Bohan and Peters classification criteria, tried to incorporate things like MRI and some uh, recent lab work and things like that that we've had. But what's really changed is we realized that polymyositis, dermatomyositis really isn't just a disease of the muscles and that there's multiple, multiple variations that have ended up being identified over the last couple of years. Some of these differ in terms of the muscles that are involved or the intensity of muscle inflammation. Some of these don't have any muscle inflammation, but have skin or internal organ manifestations. And really one of the emphasis has been on understanding that the non-musculoskeletal manifestations are really important for many of these subtypes. So in 2017, the European League Against Rheumatism and the American College of Rheumatology ended up releasing the latest evolution of the classification criteria, which is really exciting. Instead of doing a yes or no, it's a weighted probability score and we can use it for both adults and kids, which is cool, it's less stuff to have to remember. It incorporates some of this later understanding of autoantibody features and specific muscle biopsy features that we end up seeing. But most importantly, compared to the Bohan and Peter criteria, while we still Still have good identification of people with classic presentation of disease, we better capture those myositis subtypes that are atypical or may not have muscle involvement. So why is this cool? Why does it care? Well, a lot of this has ended up sparking a lot of interest in doing formal trials of classification, of diagnosis, of prognosis of these patients, which we really didn't have the chance to do when people didn't have a unified diagnosis looking at these different subtypes. We really have put an emphasis on the non-musculoskeletal myositis manifestations and really over the last couple of years have had multiple studies showing that cardiac involvement is actually more prominent than we originally thought, including cardiomyopathy, that a lot of these patients have skin involvement, which is a, a considerable source of morbidity. So this is a patient of mine that has MDA5 myositis and it's ulcerated through her skin completely. You can actually see her flexor tendons of her fingers through the, uh, the skin itself. Um, we've noticed that lung involvement is really predominant and important in a lot of these uh, manifestations. 
Um, some of these have potentially rapidly progressive disease. So this, that same patient who over the course of six months went from a relatively clear CT of the chest to having these dense infiltrates and being on six liters of oxygen at rest. And a lot of these studies have really kind of emphasized and reaffirmed that association with cancer and myositis. So about five to 10% of the polymyositis, dermatomyositis cases that we see have cancer over the next three to five years. And that's up to 30% with some of these subtypes. Um, we've really identified along those lines a subtype called antisynthetase syndrome. And so this was originally classically described back in the 1980s as a cluster of having muscle involvement, some skin involvement, oftentimes lung involvement, and oftentimes associated with JO1 antibodies. But over the last uh, five years or so, we've really identified a lot of subtypes within the subtype with the identification of additional autoantibodies that may be present and realized that a lot of these additional autoantibodies have variants in the uh, phenotypic manifestations that they'll end up having. Oftentimes, a lot of these other additional subtypes have a worse prognosis than not um, for the classic JO1 associated antisynthetase syndrome, almost twice the five year mortality. And oftentimes, in antisynthetase syndrome, it's actually the interstitial lung disease that's prominent for most of these subtypes. Many of these patients first present with dyspnea to our pulmonology colleagues or to their primary care. Many of them may not have actual muscle involvement, and 40% of the mortality in and this subtype is actually thought to be due to the ILD. Um, recently, the ACR and ULAR have actually sponsored uh, classification criteria specifically trying to identify antisynthetase syndrome and for us to all agree on what antisynthetase syndrome is. It's a four-year international project. I'm proud to say that Emory was one of the invited sites between some of my pulmonology colleagues and myself. And so hopefully we'll have these things published in the next two years or so. Um, Going on to diagnosis, this has also been something that's been both advanced and kind of a little bit problematic still. A recent retrospective study showed that in dermatomyositis patients, there was an average delay of over a year and a half or so between their original presentation and when they were finally correctly diagnosed. This was even longer if they didn't have muscle involvement. But there's increasing recognition that certain techniques like these myositis specific autoantibodies may actually aid in diagnosis. And some of the research cohorts have shown that 40 to 70% of patients with polymyositis or dermatomyositis may have myositis specific autoantibodies. So what are myositis specific autoantibodies? They're actually a set of proteins that have been progressively identified over the years that are thought to be unique to, having, uh, to patients that have autoimmune muscle inflammation or autoimmune lung inflammation or one of these subtypes of autoimmune myositis. And so they're helpful for diagnosis, but we've also started clustering people and realizing that the myositis specific antibodies can help us with figuring out the phenotypic presentation and prognosis of many of these subtypes. For instance, Patients with MI2 uh, dermatomyositis tend to have a classic dermatomyositis that tends to be responsive to uh, immunosuppression and things like that, whereas HMG-CR antibodies are, tend to be associated with an intense inflammation that has a poor long-term prognosis and can be associated with statin use, and of course those antisynthetase antibodies that we ended up talking about. So previously the myositis antibody testing was really restricted to research labs, but now it's increasingly easy to get these myositis panels through commercial vendors like LabCorp, Quest, ARUP. And so there's hope that maybe this increased myositis antibody testing will aid in the early diagnosis of myositis. There was a report out of Duke from a few years ago in which they looked at all the myositis panels sent over a year and about 12 of them were, 12% uh, of them overall were positive, about 11% of those were from patients that actually presented to pulmonology and interstitial lung disease clinics. So a lot of these patients may not have had muscle involvement and yet were diagnosed with having a subtype of autoimmune myositis uh, further on. Project I was involved with at the University of Pennsylvania showed just how exponential the use of these commercial myositis autoantibody panels have been. And it's not just for rheumatology, which are the, the purple bars here, but it's also been from our colleagues in pulmonology, which are the blue bars, uh, patients that are inpatient medicine, the green bars, and also our dermatology colleagues, the brown bars. So this is really something that's a multidisciplinary type of a disease process that's going on. 
But this commercial myocytes panel testing have also raised questions about what's the sensitivity and specificity of that versus the gold standard and what's the reproducibility of these things like. So they need to be taken with caution. Um, a, another recent study actually had same patient samples tested using three different commercial assays. And they realized that even in patients that had known myositis, there was inconsistency of the myositis assay results they were getting amongst these different vendors. And there was notable false positive rates with patients that didn't have myositis or had other autoimmune diseases. Again, going back to that project at the University of Pennsylvania, we also found that about 10% of our interstitial lung disease patients without muscle involvement actually had myositis specific antibodies on commercial testing. But if we look objectively at patients that definitively had polymyositis or dermatomyositis by objective criteria, only about 10 to 20% of these guys were MSA positive, which is a far cry from that 40 to 70% that's quoted in the literature for the gold standard in these research cohorts. So hopefully that means that some of these positive myositis antibody panels may be helpful, but the negative predictive value of them may be a little bit limited. Kind of briefly touching on treatments for the last couple of minutes, we're still really limited in terms of the data about myositis treatments. And a lot of this is still empiric. We use steroids and steroids and more steroids, and oftentimes the usual suspects that you've heard about with some of our other autoimmune diseases. Um, the first real trial that we ended up having that was randomized was the RIM study um, back in 2013, in which they did show a positive benefit in terms of um, mortality if you're using either early or late rituximab. And since that point in time, over the last couple of years, um, there have been uh, several recent studies that have further supported that rituximab is helpful in terms of both the morbidity and the long-term mortality in these patients, but that it's actually most efficacious if patients are found to have positive myositis-specific antibodies or patients with antisynthetase syndrome. Um, we've recently also taken a clue from our cardiology colleagues and realized that we need to have trials with cool names and things like that. So there have been some recent small studies looking at Abitacep, Dorencia, you may have seen this on TV. Um, there's the ongoing attack MyILD trial being run out of the University of Pittsburgh, where they're looking specifically at using Abitacep for antisynthetase lung disease. And there's also been some interest in using tofacitinib, a JAK stat inhibitor. Um, the STIR trial out of Hopkins actually ended up showing some benefit in both muscle and skin involvement. And then there are some small trials, including one that was published in 2019 um, in the New England Journal that showed this really impressive benefit for rapidly progressive lung disease compared to historic controls and actually showed this marked decrease in six month mortality as well as one year mortality for a lot of these patients. Um, there's also been interest in novel treatments. So again, proud to say that the Emory Myositis Clinic is one of seven sites that's participating in this phase two randomized control trial of a first in class novel agent that actually is a selective immunoproteasome inhibitor. So it has multiple effects on multiple different pathways in the immune system and on multiple different lines. There's actually a sister trial that's going, going in uh, lupus nephritis and actually thoughts that maybe this, if this shows to be safe and efficacious, maybe it might be helpful for other disciplines as well, including our transplant colleagues or maybe some of our colleagues in oncology. Excitingly, one of the novel treatments that was discovered was actually exercise. Who would have thought it? So previously it was thought that exercise might be damaging to muscle tissue because you're straining it more, but recent trials have actually supported that certain regimens may help with the morbidity, but even more interestingly, may actually be an immune modulator, just like the other medications we use, and may actually help to quiet down muscle inflammation in and of itself. So at the end of the day, why do you care about some of these new treatments that are coming? Well, better treatment options means that it's more likely that non-rheumatologists will end up encountering consequences of the chronic diseases, including sequelae from the disease, and also the side effects, including metabolic derangements that a lot of these therapies end up having. These new treatment pathways, like we mentioned, may also influence other diseases, other discoveries, other disciplines, just like the CTLA-4 pathway ended up influencing immuno uh, checkpoint inhibitors in oncology. So in summary, I would say that myositis is increasingly better classified and hopefully it's gonna be better recognized by all of us. 
the extra muscular manifestations are really important in myositis, even if they don't have muscle inflammation, and that myositis specific autoantibodies are playing an increasing role in both the diagnosis and the management of myositis, but that these commercial tests that we have are probably useful but may have flaws, and that our treatment options are exponentially expanding. Management will oftentimes take collaboration. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm proud that we actually have a myositis subspecialty clinic now. We have close collaborations between myself and Dr. John and our colleagues in pulmonology, dermatology, neurology, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to expand on these things in the future. Um, with that, I'll end up pausing and going ahead and uh, handing off to my colleague, Dr. Kur Shahi. Thank you, Pratik. Um, can everyone see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm, uh, I have less than 10 minutes, but uh, I'm going to talk to you more about familiar topics that you have been hearing in the past year or so, unfortunately. I'm not going to go into complicated diseases that you may not see uh, much, uh, but uh, more COVID updates in rheumatology. So I was planning to talk about these four topics. We'll see how we go with the time, mostly the outcome of COVID-19 in patients with rheumatic diseases, talk about the involvement of the autoimmune disease and syndromes potentially associated with COVID, challenges and unknowns regarding vaccination of patients with autoimmune disease and on immunosuppressions, and prolonged and mutated viral infections in immunocompromised patients. We may leave the last topic for another talk. Um, so from the beginning of the uh, pandemic uh, last year, uh, patients and rheumatologists were asking these questions that are patients with rheumatic diseases who are mostly on immunosuppressive medications at increased uh, risk of poor outcomes of COVID-19 or not. I mean, definitely any kind of infection could have poor outcome in patients who are immunosuppressed. But on the other hand, we were seeing hyperinflammation was a major, is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in COVID-19. And then later we saw that glucocorticoid showed uh, improvement in the outcome of those patients. So still the uncertainty about continuing or withholding immune therapies in our patients uh, during the pandemic uh, existed. From the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, there was a global uh, alliance, um, global rheumatology alliance registry that started at UCSF and initially was provider entered registry and later patient registry that so far uh, accumulated about 10,000 patients in that registry to figure out what are the outcomes related to specific diseases, outcomes related to specific treatments for our patients. And it's global, so from all over the country, multiple publications came out of that. And I'm just going to review a couple of them, uh, most importantly, uh, characteristics associated with hospitalization and death for you guys. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, nearly half of the cases of uh, patients with autoimmune diseases who uh, got COVID-19 were hospitalized and with 9% uh, death. And uh, the main risk factors for hospitalizations were similar to general population as age and cardiovascular diseases standing out. Um, what stood out was really use of chronic steroid treatment. Greater than 10 milligram per day was the most um, important risk factors for hospitalization. Diagnosis of SLE and vasculitis were more um, uh, associated with patients who were hospitalized, but uh, majority of those patients were on steroid, chronic steroid treatment. Interestingly, uh, use of uh, disease modifying agents or steroid sparing agents uh, in combination or without biologic agents was not associated with increased risk of hospitalization and anti-TNF specifically, actually those patients were hospitalized less than others. So uh, most recent publication from this registry uh, looked at the uh, patients from March uh, to July 2020, uh, about 4,000 patients, and that um, actually looked at the factors associated with COVID-19 related death in these patients. Again, like general population, older age, male sex, and cardiovascular and chronic lung disease had more association with death, prednisone, prednisone greater than 10 milligram, um, interestingly, moderate or high disease activity of their autoimmune disease uh, had uh, worse outcome. 
And the only medications that stood out, I'm gonna show you here, were um, rituximab, which is a B-cell depletion agent, agent, showed increased odds ratio for death, and uh, sulfasalazine, for some reason that we don't know yet, and we haven't figured out why, had more association with death. Uh, it is not an immunosuppressive medication compared to others. It, we consider it more immunomodulator, but there is something with COVID that had increased odds ratio of death, and of course, the steroid. Um, here, we looked at the uh, patients with rheumatic diseases at Emory system, and this data was until July, and we showed, actually, our data was very similar to what the registry found out, that uh, mostly uh, higher dose of a steroid had association with hospitalization, and TNF inhibitor patients had actually less hospitalization compared to others. So uh, based on multiple case series from all around the world and what I just showed you, the lessons that we have learned so far is our patients need to have controlled disease um, activity. So we have to continue their treatments uh, for um, different type of diseases that they have with immunosuppressive medications and not withholding the immunosuppressive medications to uh, try to reduce their disease flares, to try to reduce their use of glucocorticoids to have better outcome um, and um, use immunosuppressive medications, including rituximab with caution, but definitely the goal would be to get their disease under control. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about the development of autoimmune diseases uh, after the SARS-CoV uh, COVID infection. Um, so this has been from the beginning. Uh, we have seen patients um, with COVID, the majority of the morbidity and mortality that happens is actually related to the break of the immune tolerance and triggering of um, um, significant immune responses. Uh, so should we call it autoimmune responses or really immune responses? That's another question. But really the cytokine um, uh, storms and cytokine production and significant immune response causes the majority of the multi-system damage in these patients. Uh, we all have seen multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID initially in children, which looked like Kawasaki disease. And now we are seeing more and more uh, with adults. Uh, this is a patient actually, we were consulted at Grady, uh, uh, one of the residents, Chris Kinter, it has been involved uh, heavily with this case. And a uh, patient presented similar to vasculitis, had leukocytoclastic vasculitis on rash uh, on the, in his body and then found out to have all organs involved, heart, muscles, um, and liver. And uh, these are patients that are examples of how the uh, similarity in terms of manifestations and uh, pathogenesis of the disease is with autoimmune diseases. Uh, our colleague, Dr. Sands and uh, Dr. Uh, An Young Lee in, uh, uh, at Emory have shown um, that actually patients with uh, COVID, some patients with COVID uh, have um, um, dominant extra follicular B cell responses very similar uh, to the way that lupus patients have. So this group has studied and is experts in the world in terms of like the B cell responses in lupus patients. And they have observed some of the sickest COVID patients actually have very similar patterns in their B cell profile. Other studies and groups around the world are showing that there are increased rate of autoantibodies in patients with COVID-19. In one study showed 45% of COVID patients had positive autoantibodies. And these patients who have positive autoantibody have actually worse prognosis and significantly higher respiratory rate on admission. Um, I'm not gonna go to the details of these autoantibodies because of the time, but definitely ANA and antiphospholipid are on the uh, uh, highest part of the list. So clinically, um, we have uh, heard and seen case reports and cases in our own hospital with cold agglutinin syndrome, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Guillain-Barre and Miller-Fisher syndromes have been uh, reported. Uh, uh, we have seen actually systemic lupus erythematosus and it's published. Um, inflammatory arthritis um, is seen after um, in patients who had no um, uh, history or symptoms of these conditions and right after their COVID diagnosis. Um, and these uh, diagnoses came up. Um, 
there are multiple clinics and um, people who are interested in following up patients who have had infection with COVID in long term and find out are these really temporary autoimmunities or are these going to be established diagnosis for these people. And um, uh, at Emory, we have a COVID uh, clinic run by Dr. Cassidy and Dr. Kaysen that we are interested to see these patients. So if you guys see patients who have um, symptoms of autoimmunity or antibodies, definitely we'll be happy to evaluate them. So briefly we'll discuss, I think I have three minutes left. So just the COVID vaccinations and autoimmune disease and challenges that we are faced that uh, uh, our patients uh, have been asking if they can get the vaccine and if they are going to have the same immunogenicity as initially it was announced that people who have autoimmune disease, they have to discuss it with their doctors. So American College of Rheumatology very quickly developed a, su a guidance summary for rheumatologists um, to have available in terms of like uh, um, what are going to be our recommendations for our patients. So definitely the major point is, yes, we want all our uh, patients with autoimmune diseases and on immunosuppressive medications receive COVID vaccination. It may not give them um, the same uh, uh, immunogenicity as other people who are not on immunosuppressive medications will develop, but it will give them some uh, that is going to be better than getting COVID as we saw the outcomes are not as good. Um, but there were specific um, recommendations. I'm sorry, this slide is uh, busy, but a specific recommendations in terms of medications. And these are all based uh, on the evidence that we have with vaccinations of flu and pneumonia in patients with autoimmune disease and uh, immunosuppressive medications. Majority of the medications that we use, we don't need to do any modification and they can just take the vaccine. Um, uh, specifically for methotrexate and uh, JAK inhibitors to facitinib and baricitinib, we want the patients to hold their medication one week after each vaccine dose. With abatacep, uh, we want them to hold it one week before and after the first dose. And cyclophosphamide and rituximab are more complicated, and I'm not going to go to the details of those, but we try to um, actually give it to the patients one week before the next dose. So we want to get the medication kind of like effect wear off in their system before doing that. But those are, I think, more, those patients need to discuss it with the rheumatologist before even getting their, their vaccine. Um, the, the other key uh, important factor here is that uh, patients are concerned about the uh, activation of their diseases and what we know from other vaccinations is that uh, the chance of activation of the disease is very low if their disease is under control. So we tell them to control their disease and get the vaccine. Um, so of course there are challenges and it's going to take uh, some time for us to understand the only thing that just came out um, about last week or two weeks ago in JAMA, and many of you have seen that, is the data for COVID vaccination of patients on transplant. And unfortunately, it showed that only 17% of patients um, after getting an mRNA vaccine uh, had antibodies detectable for anti-S1. Of course, it has limitations. This study has limitations. It wasn't long enough to see if there are other um, uh, than humoral immunity and uh, uh, antibody development in this study. But of course, it brings the challenges for us to study and evaluate Im immunogenicity of COVID vaccine in patients who have rheumatic diseases and immunosuppressive medications. So I'm just going to stop here because I know I'm over time. And um, uh, if people are here and want to stay for uh, questions, we are happy to do that. If not, you can email us and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Doctor, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was reading the comments and Dr. Krakow said to keep going is an important topic. So if we wanted to continue and the Zoom um, owner didn't mind, we could continue if you wanted to. Okay. Is that okay with Kimberly? Um, Kimberly is the owner of the Zoom, and I, I don't know if she has anything scheduled after. It, it, if you have like one more slide to present, that's fine. But I think most people are going to need to to leave soon. Okay. But yeah. But thank you guys so much for you know this really fantastic presentation. I'm I'm uh, in the first three struck so much by how much we don't know and how 
my, it feels like you guys all described sarcoidosis and lupus and myositis in ways that suggest to me that there are probably lots of like little sub diseases within those or, you know, that, that dictate what the different manifestations are. And do you think that, um, therapies are going to end up trying to parse out these very, these subtle differences and presentations with different therapies, or do you think newer therapies in the future will somehow find common, um, pathways? Well, we need to do both, and but we definitely need more work along the lines of better understanding the immunophenotypes that are within these very heterogeneous diseases. That's for sure. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's fascinating. And Raju, thank you so much for the update with COVID. I wish that transplant study had looked after the second dose because I think that's a major limitation of that study and knowing what the responses are. Yeah, um, sure, there will be more coming, uh, but it's just concerning for our patients or us. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's a common question. All right, well, the hour is late, so I will um, uh, let you guys go. But uh, again, um, this has been terrific. Um, uh, thank you. And join us um, next week. Um, we will have an a outside visiting speaker, Dr. Eric Kirkle, will be talking to us. So, until next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.